Now in this problem, we are asked to solve the differential equation and specifically to solve for the initial condition that we're given. As we look, we see dy dx, we know that's the derivative of y with respect to x, equals x times the square root of x squared plus 9. To begin to solve this differential equation, we will need to integrate both sides. Now as we integrate the left side, we know to integrate the derivative of y with respect to x, we get back our original equation y, and then we're left with the integral of x times the square root of x squared plus 9 with respect to x. Thinking back to our integration techniques, we think through how could I integrate this, and particularly we see that since we have our inside function to the square root, it is related up to a constant manipulation. If we take its derivative, we'll get something very related to the outside term. This is what helps us recognize we should use u substitution. Here our u will be the inside x squared plus 9. Now we take the derivative of that, we know the derivative of that, our du term is 2x dx. However, when we look at our expression, we don't have 2x dx, we just have x dx. So we manipulate our du term and move around the constant, divide both sides by 2, and we get 1 half du is equal to x dx, and then we apply our substitution into the integral. Now as we substitute, we see our 1 half du, we pull the constant out in front just to clean up our integral. And then this is a basic integration problem. We know when we integrate an exponent, we would add 1 to the power and divide by it. So our original expression is the constant multiple times adding 1 to 1 half should get us 3 halves. When we divide by it, we get u to the 3 halves over 3 halves, and then plus our initial condition c. Combining our constants, we get 1 half times 2 thirds. So y is 1 third u to the 3 halves plus c. And finally, we substitute back for what u is. And if we didn't have our initial condition, this is where we'd have to stop. However, since we are given extra information that if you input negative 4 to the x value of our equation y, we should get back 0, we can solve and isolate what c is. So let's substitute negative 4 into our expression of x here. Now as we simplify the interior, we see that we have 16 plus 9, that's 25, so 0 equals 1 third times 25 to the 3 halves plus c. The square root of 25 is 5, cubed is 125, so this becomes 0 equals 125 over 3 plus c, which tells us that c would have to be negative 125 over 3. Substituting the known value for c back into our equation, we get our final answer is 1 third times x squared plus 9 all raised to the 3 halves minus 125 over 3. In this next problem, we're again asked to solve our differential equation with the initial condition. We begin by integrating both sides. We see as we integrate the left side, we just get back our equation y. And then we need to determine how can we integrate x e to the negative x with respect to x. Now I'd encourage you to take a moment to think through your integral techniques and try to figure out what method would allow us to integrate the right side of this equation. Here, integration by parts will be useful, particularly if we let the u and the integration by parts be the x, because once we do that, the du term becomes dx, and then our integral will become subsequently simpler. So let's set about integration by parts. Our integration by parts formula says if you're integrating u dv, that would be equivalent to u times v minus the integral of v du. Now we're choosing our u to be x, because we can quickly differentiate that and we see that our du term would then be dx. Now our dv term is the remaining part of the original integral, so that's e to the negative x dx. As we integrate that, we know that integrating both sides will give us v, and then we integrate e to the negative x, and we should get negative e to the negative x. 
we apply our integration by parts formula, clean up a little bit of the algebra, and nicely the integral that we're looking at is one that we already did as we integrated our dv term. We know the integral of e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x plus our constant of integration. Our next task will be to use our initial condition to actually identify what our constant of integration should be. So everywhere there was an x, we'll input a 0, and then the resulting equation will give us 1 based on our initial condition. So we solve that. 1 equals negative 0 times e to the negative 0 minus e to the negative 0 plus c. Now 0 times anything finite is 0, so that term goes to 0. e to the negative 0 is the same as e to the 0, of course, which is equal to 1. So this becomes 1 equals negative 1 plus c. We can solve that, and we would see c should be positive 2. And we have now found our solution to the differential equation that satisfies the given initial condition. Now our next problem is phrased a little differently, but it's really asking the same question. We are given a differential equation that satisfies an initial condition, and we're asked to find the original equation y of x that fits those criteria. So given our differential equation, we know we should integrate both sides in this case. Integrating the left side will give us back our original equation y because we're integrating the derivative of y with respect to x. And the integral of sine of 5x dx. Now hopefully we've practiced so much that we know instinctively the integral of sine of 5x is negative cosine of 5x divided by 5 plus our constant of integration. If that's the case, great work there. Now, if we want a little review, we can go over how to find this integral step by step using u substitution. If this doesn't apply to you, feel free to skip forward a little bit as we solve for our initial condition. So as we're integrating this, we could use u substitution. Our u is our 5x. du is 5 dx. Now notice we only have the dx term. We don't have 5 as our constant multiple out in front. So we just manipulate the constant, divide both sides by 5, and we get 1 fifth du is exactly what we have present in our integral. So we have y is equal to the integral of sine of u times 1 fifth du. Let's bring our 1 fifth constant multiple out in front of the integral. And then it comes down to one of our known integrals. The integral of sine is negative cosine. So y is add the negative to the 1 fifth cosine of u plus c, and then we substitute back in for u. Now all that's left at this point is to substitute and solve for our initial condition. We know the equation is equal to 2 when our input is 0. Cosine of 5 times 0 is the same as cosine of 0, which we know from our unit circle to be 1. So we have 2 equals negative 1 fifth plus c. And then solving for c, we get 11 fifths. So our solution to the initial condition is y equals negative cosine of 5x over 5 plus 11 fifths. In this problem, we are asked to find the position function, x of t, of a moving particle with the given acceleration, a of t, initial position, and initial velocity given below. So our particle move has acceleration with respect to time of 2t plus 1. And now we need to recall the relationship between acceleration, velocity, and position. Now the integral of acceleration with respect to time is going to give us velocity. And then similarly, if we integrate velocity with respect to time, we will then get our position function. Now we were given our acceleration, so let's begin by integrating it to get the velocity equation. The integral of 2t plus 1 dt, that is 
t squared plus t plus our constant of integration. And we will use our initial condition related to velocity to find exactly what is that c going to be for this problem. So this is common notation. Remember, v sub 0 is the velocity when our input is equal to 0. Just a bit of shorthand. So here we know when our input t is 0, the output to our velocity equation is negative 7. So we can set that up and solve for c. Negative 7 equals 0 squared plus 0 plus c. Very quickly we see that c is negative 7. Now the goal of this problem was to find the position function. We now have the velocity, but that was a needed step along the path to get to our final solution. We know how position and velocity are related. If we now integrate our velocity function, we will get our position function. Integrating this, we get 1 third t cubed plus 1 half t squared minus 7 t plus a constant of integration. And the way we'll identify this constant integration is through the initial condition related to position, as this is our position equation. Now we know everywhere there is an input t, we'll plug in 0 for our initial condition. So 0 cubed times 1 third 0 plus 1 half 0 squared 0 minus 7 times 0 is 0. And we end up with the equation that c must be equal to 4 because all the other terms go to 0 whenever we input 0. So our position function is 1 third t cubed plus 1 half t squared minus 7 t plus 4. A drop ball accelerates downwards at a constant rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. Here we're asked to set up the differential equation for the height above the ground h in meters. And then after that, we're given the additional information that at time t equals 0, the height of the ball was 100 meters. Based on that, how long does it take for the ball to hit the ground? So let's read through this again and highlight some key pieces of information and extract the key ideas that we were given. The first thing that we want to draw our attention to is the idea that they told us the ball was dropped. Now that simple phrasing tells us a lot of information. Contrast that with if they told us the ball was thrown. When you're throwing the ball, you're imparting some initial velocity to the ball. But if you're dropping the ball, the ball was at rest and it's dropped and then it's falling under the influence of the gravitational pull alone. So here, when they tell us the ball is dropped, they're really telling us that the initial velocity is 0. We also saw, as we were reading, the initial height is 100. Next, as we read, they tell us that acceleration was constant, 9.8 meters per second squared. So we know our acceleration equation is constantly negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So we've been given information where we can find the equation for acceleration. We know about the initial velocity and the initial height. And we need to get to an equation that gives us the height, which is correspondent to the position in this problem. So we think through, how do you go from acceleration to height? We know the integral of acceleration with respect to time should give you the velocity equation. And the integral of the velocity equation with respect to time will give you the height equation. So we see our first step is to integrate our acceleration. So our velocity is going to be the integral of negative 9.8 with respect to time, which would be negative 9.8 t. And generally, we do have plus the constant of integration which for this problem is our initial velocity. But recalling that initial velocity is 0, we see that this constant term does not apply here. So we get velocity equals negative 9.8 t. We can next find the height or the vertical position of the ball above the ground by integrating the velocity.
and we get our height is negative 9.8 over 2t squared plus the initial height. And we know our initial height to be 100. So this tells us the height of the ball after it was dropped. Our question is how long does it take for the ball to hit the ground? So visualizing when the ball hits the ground, think about what we know about the height at that moment. The height is measured as distance above the ground, so once it's hit the ground, there's no distance above the ground and height is equal to zero. So we need to solve for what t value does our height equation equal zero. So setting that up, we have when height is zero, we will subtract 100 from both sides, divide by negative 4.9, and then take the square root. And then that would be approximately 4.5 8 when rounded looking back our time units are in terms of seconds so that's seconds